Hey everyone, welcome back to another best of for the year of 2023 from the Innovators Mindset podcast. And this theme for today is going to be on the idea of resiliency and being resilient. And what does that mean? And how do we actually embrace that notion of resiliency and seeing it as an opportunity to grow and develop. And I, I'm going to share a quick story for you before we get to our wonderful guests that I was thinking about on a run I did yesterday. And uh, I've been training for this marathon. I you're probably is kind of sick of, of hearing me talk about this marathon. I'm like a little bit sick of it. But there's so much learning that goes into this process. I feel it's really helped me in so many facets of my life because I haven't even got to the race yet. And just training for it has really helped me focus on my routines, um, you know, my my uh, physical and mental and emotional health, really thinking about how I am very cognizant of when I take breaks, how I rest, how I try to recover, and just trying to get better through the entire process. And through the training, there is just some overwhelmingly long runs. The, the actual marathon race for people that don't know, it's 42.1 kilometers, 42.2 kilometers, actually. I don't want to leave a point one out. And it is, I've done it before a long, long time ago. And I'm going to get to that in a second. It's very, very tough. It's very, very challenging. And I've done half marathons before. And half marathon is very challenging. If you've done a half marathon, it is a challenging thing. Going from a half marathon to a marathon, it's not twice as hard. It feels like it's 10 times as hard, if not harder. Anyways, for me, that's been my experience. It is just a whole um, different experience. And through the training for this 42.2 kilometer race, there's runs every week. You do a long run. You do, you know, runs throughout the week and they're, you know, medium length. And depending on your experience of doing this, you know, medium could be, 10, 10 kilometers, six miles, something like that. But then you have these long runs that you kind of build your way up to. And I've been really struggling to get over 30 kilometers. And 32 kilometers is, I think, is the longest uh, run that I have through this experience. But I just, I haven't been able to cross this 30 kilometer um, threshold. And it's really been bugging me. I tend to tap out feel dehydrated, my body goes, I get an injury, and I just seemingly couldn't break it. So yesterday, I tried some things that were a little bit different. Uh, I got up an hour earlier than what I used to, because in my mind, if I get up an hour earlier, then I'm going to be uh, at, a, at a spot quicker than I would have been a week prior. Uh, it's a mental game. You get, there's mental games you have to play with yourself to kind of go through this process, and as I was running, I was about 24, 25, and I started getting exhausted. And I started thinking, and you start doing this. You start talking yourself out of things. You start talking yourself out of finishing this race, out of doing certain things. And I was like, why can't I not get over this 30-kilometer hump? And all of a sudden, I realized in, uh, I don't even know, I was 30 years old. That was the last time I ran a marathon. And the last time I mar ran a marathon, I actually had a really severe um, foot injury during the race. And I ran as much as I could. But then I realized when I pulled out was 30 kilometers. And then I was like, I got it. And as soon as I basically said it in my head, I didn't say it out loud because that'd be weird. I was running by myself. But as soon as I said it in my head, all of a sudden I was like, that's why I haven't been able to cross it. I, I've been having this little barrier in my mind of why I can't cross it. And that was the last time. And I, I remember going through that process and I felt so much defeat. And not only did I feel defeated in the moment where I had to pull out of this race, I felt extremely defeated after. And it was something I just couldn't get back to. And, you know, I have a very different outlook on life. And I feel part of it too is that failure is just part of the process of what you do. And it's not finite. And if you're really trying to push yourself, if you're really trying to get better, failure is going to be part of the deal. That's just how it is. And I hate when people say like, oh, we need to embrace failure. It's something I just, it just bothers me so much because we're not like, yeah, you failed, right? That's not the part you need to embrace. The part we need to embrace is the getting back up. And when I was 30, 31, 32, 
I, I, I focus on the failure and I didn't focus enough on the resiliency, the getting back up part. So once I named it, once I identified the little mental hurdle, because the thing with all of this training, you start realizing that a lot of it is not physical limitations, it's mental limitations. And once I named it, then I finished the 32 kilometers. It was still horrible, by the way, just so you know, it was horrible, but I did it. And once you do it, then you realize you can do it, and then it becomes easier kind of through that process. So we can focus on failure all you want, and I understand that, but it's never been a focus for me, or I guess I shouldn't say it's never been, probably was a focus for me too much, and that's when I really, really struggled. It's the getting back up, that you understand that falling down is part of the process when you're really trying to grow, but the resiliency, the willingness to get back up is something that's really, really crucial. So I just wanna share that with you, some of my learning, and you might be listening to this and say, what is this guy who talks about education focusing on his running? I'm not focusing on running, and I, I really don't focus on education. My focus is on learning, and if we can't find learning in our everyday lives, then we're saying school and learning are two different things, and for me, this is all part of it. This is stuff that we need to kind of just kind of discuss with our students and connect with that, that because this is part of that life is how do we teach our students not just math and reading and writing, but getting back up when things don't seem to go your way. How do you overcome them? And sometimes identifying what's holding you back is the first step to getting over that hump. Just something I learned, something I want to share with you all. But if that was useless to you, I guarantee you something from my wonderful guests from this past year will resonate. Welcome back to the highlight episode from the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And you shared a story with me and I, I would love for you to share it about um, someone who you talked to recently that you encouraged to do the same thing. Can you share that with us? Because I thought that was really, really powerful. Absolutely. Well, first of all, <clears throat> going back to that day, it was, uh, man, you hit so many, we call them golden nuggets in our district. There's so many things that re resonated with me. And uh, man, when I start to think about and hear you say that, you know, you don't have to reinvent who you are, what you're doing is already there. You just got to tell your story. And man, that just hit, that's just weighed on me and weighed on me. And so we immediately start to think about, hey, how can I to tell the story. It was very unique. It was over the weekend and we had our weekly uh, leadership meeting. And uh, so what we typically do is we'll go out like it's pretty traditional. We'll visit our campuses and we come back and we do a series called Grows and Glows. Uh, we don't like to say, hey, what's bad about your uh, your campus. We like to say, hey, an opportunity for us to grow. And then things that we start with are glows. And so <clears throat> we decided that to do a little bit different than coming back and do it the old antiquated Dewey Decimal System way of just preaching out to what people saw is that I challenged them to uh, take this video approach and we're going to you send it through uh, Facebook, Twitter or Instagram, whichever you had. And so I'm going to model this and so I modeled exactly what you did to me. I asked anybody who would like to, to do this. I had a, a taker, my um, special aid director. She said, I'll do it. She came up. I asked her the question um, and I told her that, uh, you know, I'm going to record it. So I let her practice. Then after that, we recorded it. And then uh, we, uh, we we videoed that and I shot it out to Twitter and I, I tag you on it. Uh, well, tagging you on it, I'm sure was the uh, the the indig indicator. But you know, we had over 10,000 hits uh, by the end of the day. Oh, on, that's awesome! On, on that particular video, and so we went back and we used that mantra, recreated our hashtag Chapel Hill ISD, and uh, so we went around that day, and all these administrators, probably 40 or so of them in the room, are infiltrating all of our campuses, and our goal was to record. Uh, what they saw that was great on our campuses and hashtag Chapel Hill ISD. And it just went uh, that one day. It was amazing the impact Absolutely. it had throughout. And so we also do a deal that we call uh, Feel Good Friday. We like to always uh, communicate with our people. And we talked about relationships matter and making sure that people uh, you, you're able to tell your story with some things that you saw in that person. So now we challenge them to use that same videographer. Or that videography method and tag the person that you want to compliment or highlight on a feel good Friday. So that has been something that has blown up. 
So most recently, um, we I went to a uh, one of our community churches and uh, got a chance to go and visit them as we try to do with a uh, organization we call Friends of Faith. We connect many of our churches in our local area together to be a partner um, in education with our local school district. And so one of the Friends of Faith pastors, Pastor um, Randall McDonald, so we definitely want to give a shout out to him and thank him for his uh, invitation. So I got a chance to go and visit and uh, I ran into a former student uh, who was a student when I was actually the high school principal on the Chapel Hill High School campus. And uh, he was talking and we you know, gave pleasantries and hugged and uh, he told me, thank you for coming today. And he said, hey, Mr. Dean, would you do me a favor? I said, sure. What is it? He said, when you go back on campus uh, next week, would you go and tell Aaron Steele, uh, who is a history teacher in our district? Uh, man, just tell him I said, hi, thank you so much for uh, what he did for me as a student. And I said, hey, you want to tell him yourself? And he said, sure. And I told him exactly what I was going to do. Here we are in the foyer of the church and uh, we're sitting here talking. I said, all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record this and I'm going to put it on my Twitter. You're OK with that? He said, absolutely. I am. Right. So I asked him the question. I said, hey, I'm here with a former student. He want to give a, a shout out to one of his former teachers. And he gave a man. He gave a chilling testimony, a chilling testimony about how impactful Coach Steele was for him. And uh, at the end, of course, I pushed it out on on um, on my Twitter. But what I also did was I sent that to Aaron Steele. Um, and actually, he didn't have his number in my phone. I sent it to his wife and said, hey, make sure you get that to Aaron. And, you know, just the power of encouragement. We're talking about encouragement, motivation. Right. People today, especially teachers who feel overwhelmed, uh, maybe don't feel like that their work that they're doing is worthwhile uh, to be able to get that type of statement from a student, as right. we would say, from the mouth of babes, to be able to encourage him and others who see it to continue to do in the work uh, that we all signed up to do to help impact children and change lives. Man, that was powerful to me, but it also showed me that nugget that I was able to get from you at that session and how that has really impacted my leadership in such a short time. So uh, for that, I thank you. Well, they, you know, the, as you're, as you're telling this story um, about this, the, the whole premise, uh, and I don't know if you've, you've read uh, because of a teacher, we wrote because of a teacher, because of exactly what you talked about is that so many teachers have had this tremendous impact on so many kids, but they rarely know about it. They, and they, they, I guess innately know they've done it, but they don't necessarily hear from the kids they served. So yeah. we wanted to make sure that we were, you know, honoring teachers from our past that have had a tremendous impact on, on so many other people. And there, there's two things I want to share that really kind of struck me as you're talking, as soon as I saw you, do that post, you tag me. I was so excited about it. I start digging through your Twitter. Yeah. So I don't just see you highlighting the adults. Then I see you with kids. Then I'm like seeing you do this stuff over and over again. And what's really kind of cool about this in education. And I, I, I truly believe um, in my first 10, 15 years of education, um, we have grown way more in the last five. And my belief is because because of the access that we have to one another. So I took your stuff, I blogged about it, highlighted it, a bunch of people see my blog um, of your work, and then they're like, I'm gonna start doing this. And so it's not just that it really makes a difference in Chapel Hill, it then starts to spread out through education. And you were talking about this earlier, we wanna help kids no matter what school district they're in, yeah. right? And this is, and now I feel bad because this is like a question that's like, because you could get in this a book, but I, I, now I feel bad. What is like one strategy you share in the book that could be helpful to someone listening to this right now? Okay. You don't have to feel bad. I mean, again, I know, like okay. I have I'm all like, sorts You should read the book though. Like <laughs> you're share something from the book. You get it for free right now, but you should be at the book. And I, and I'm not, I don't get any money for this either. Like I just, <laughs> it's a really good book. So I just wanted to share that. Well, thank you. Yeah. I think sometimes when we look at team building or um, culture building in our meetings, we think of like camp kind of activities. And it's so interesting because I've put a lot of stuff out like on, on TikTok or about icebreakers and like beginning of staff meetings and, and what should we do? And there's, I get a lot of feedback. So it's it's all good conversation. I, th I don't mind just throwing right. things out there that might challenge yeah. our thinking. Absolutely. But 
in the book, um, I actually share an idea that I got from Brene Brown's um, Dare to Lead book, which is identifying our own two core values and doing that collaboratively. And I'll just share with you a story from when I did this with my staff. Um, so basically, I on Brene's website, she has a list of 100 core values. And the, the, the practice is you select the ones that speak to you, then whittle it down to 10, whittle it down to five, whittle it down to two. And I, I was listening, re-listening to her book one summer a couple years ago, and I thought, I don't even know what my core values are. So I'm going to do this exercise myself. And when I did that, the exercise, I identified two core values of mine as integrity and making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I thought, gosh, I really think my staff should know that these are my two core values because they, these core values motivate a lot of my behavior. Mm -hmm. But then Brene talks about like, what if the staff knew each other's core values. And she tells a story about her CFO and how he kept questioning her about financial decisions she was making. And he thought, she thought he was like really judgy and didn't trust her when they did this exercise. And she found out that like financial stability is one of his two core values, which like brilliant that he's right. her CFO and that's one of his two core values. But she just began to look at his questioning of her in a different light. Like this mm -hmm. is driven by your core value, not by your judgment of me. And the same thing happened in my staff. So um, we had a staff member who notoriously, and she knew this, um, was it felt a little judgy about like bulletin boards and kind of like the physical displays that would be up in the, the school. Like if I had put a bulletin board up, she would be out there like with a staple remover and a stapler and straightening things up. And, and I was like, finally, I'm like, I'm not even doing bulletin boards because I know I can't mm -hmm. do them good enough. To, to for this particular staff member. But we did this exercise in identifying our core values at the beginning of the year. And one of the core values on Brene's list is beauty. And I thought, who's going to mm. choose beauty as one of their two core values? Like I was a little judgy about that. Right. But this staff member chose beauty as mm. one of her two core values. And the end game there is we started looking at that as a strength of hers and a gift she can provide the school rather than a judgment. So understanding right. it was more about her and her view of the world than about us. And like she became the head of the beautify Quincy elementary I committee. Yeah. Yes. So that's team building. Mm -hmm. That's understanding each other. That's way better than any kind of camp activity. And of course there has to be a culture of trust and how we did this activity um, with my staff is I, I bought little canvases from the dollar store and, and I bought paint pens and they created just a little piece of artwork. They had their name and their two core values. And I didn't make them stand up in a circle and share their core values with each other because some of them seemed a little bit uncomfortable with it. Like it was a little personal mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And so um, they were, they just shared them in small groups with their, mm -hmm. their team. So I think we just had to be careful when we're, when we're doing activities like this about how we ask them to share with each other, but yep. it, it was hugely valuable for um, my staff. And I think for any staff. Well, you know, that, that I love that focusing on core values and, you know, really kind of that asset thinking mm -hmm. and developing strengths there. There was a time I was in uh, a school and I remember being there and I, I really, one of the things I always challenge people is to look at things with, fresh eyes, like you've never been there before. And there is in the gymnasium where they'd have, you know, or sorry, the auditorium where they'd have big events and things like that. And the whole school would go into, there's like a, a, a big portrait. I can't remember what was in the portrait, but what I can remember was the frame was cracked and it was broken. And I'm like, do you understand that every time kids walk into this room or there is this, basically this, portrait that has a giant crack in it it's just like like we just let things kind of go around here right and mm -hmm. there's there's i you know i i've shared the story before there's a certain sense in um it tells you a lot about a leader if, if they if they see a piece of garbage in front of the school and if they walk by it and ignore it or pick it up mm -hmm. because because it does say something to our community it does say something to our kids that we don't necessarily care enough about this space to you have it look its best. So like that notion of beauty, that's the first thing I thought of was how, what does that say to our kids when 
we don't really care about the surroundings that they're walking into every single day, as opposed to like, we have a sense of pride because right. this is such a beautiful place. And this is so important on, you know, how we respect, um, you know, the, the area. So I, I just love that. What was your, like your hopes for, you know, what this book would do to, to really help schools, you know, in a time where, you know, there's, there's obviously some negative uh, conversations about schools from the outside. Well, so many people, George, get thrown into school communication without any communication background. Um, right. I'm one of them. Like I was a chemistry business major back in uh, college oh. and got my MBA and now I run a social media company. But we've all, um, especially us, I'm, I'm now 45. I didn't grow up with social media. Right. So I had to learn it. And schools really inviting and, and using this as a tool, it's been something that you've kind of had to try by trial and error. Mm -hmm. and, and we know good things are happening, but how do we get the stories? How do we monitor the comments and how do we handle all of this? Um, so I really wanted to put together a thorough guide. I do a lot of webinars. I have a podcast of my own. Like I've got um, uh, hundreds of blogs out there. But I didn't have one resource to be able to say, hey, you know, person who just got right. handed the keys to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, like here's some proper ways of how you should use it for a public school, private school, charter school. This is really meant for all K-12 schools. Um, but I think now in their hand, they've got a five section book that really breaks down, you know, um, just some of the systems and the branding and the storytelling and and best practices and, and professional development that they can use to, to really engage their mm. community, engage right. parents, but also 70% of your community has nobody in school right now. And right. so can we amplify those stories? And, and me as a parent of six kids who don't say, they don't tell me what's going on at school, George. And so because of social media, I can see what they're learning, what they're experiencing, and it can lead to some great engagement. Yeah. And it, and I think that was a, a big thing for me too. It wasn't just like, cause you, you saw the, you know, kind of, I know it's kind of weird to say old school, but people would have websites and it was just a one-way communication tool. Right. And then they moved to social media and they, they use it as a one-way communication tool when it actually had the opportunity to have conversations and to kind of connect. And one of the things that I was really passionate about was not limiting it to a just like one person was in, in charge of the communication and mm -hmm. e even in Navier's mindset i shared this that uh a twitter handle is about communication a hashtag is about community i'm andrew Murata, school leader here in port jervis new york i gotta give a shout out to the raiders uh we're an hour and a half northwest of new york city i've been a school leader here for 20 years uh, and George, right. We're proud of where we are. Uh, I'm so invested here. Our graduation rate used to be in the sixties and we're in the nineties now, right, right, right at that 90 mark and, uh, great things are happening here. So I'm, I'm honored to be here and, and be part of the work, uh, that that's been happening. And through that journey, right. I've fallen in love with writing and presenting to other principals and helping others along the way. So it's been, it's been a great journey. Okay, so this, this is the first question I'm going to ask. I'm going to see if you can share the secret. I don't know if you're going to keep this to everybody. So if you went from 60 to 90, what was it, like, what did you do? Like, what, what did you do that that changed? Yeah, Let's, is this going to be the 24-hour podcast between me and you? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, you know, that's what I was, even that, what you just said, kind of stuck in my mind. Because a lot of times, people want to attribute a change like that to we did this one thing yeah, and then everything changed, but probably it's a combination of multiple things, but then it's also harder to quantify how, what percentage of those multiple things you did led to it. Right? Like I think about that all the time. Cause it's like, you don't, you don't know this one thing was the ultimate change. If you're doing, especially if you're doing four or five things in a district to improve stuff. So like, so like, if you can even think of two or three things that helped you on that, cause I know it'd be, you know, probably you couldn't say all of the things, all the ways your district came together, all the ways your, you know, teachers really kind of implemented things and, you know, did them, did them really well. So what, what would you kind of say stuck out to you? Well, and I love listening to your work, George, and you're so well read and you, your memory of remembering what people said, what, 
Uh, so in your style, I'm going to tell a little story. Malcolm Gladwell did a TED talk called Choice, Happiness, and Spaghetti Sauce, right? And and the, in the talk, uh, Howard Moskowitz wanted to come up with the best spaghetti sauce for the company, right? And he did all this work and all this research. And in the in the talk, Malcolm Gladwell shares that there is no perfect spaghetti sauce. Right. It's variety, right? Some people like chunky. Some people like spicy. Some people like uh, marinara, right? And it's the same in schools. There's no one perfect thing there's no one perfect um and it's you know like you just said all of those good things moving forward uh together the first thing the most important is that we cleaned up the place george they used to allow smoking there was smoking everywhere the bathrooms were smoke it was things were dirty they were dingy think about the world we live in today you go to an airbnb or you go to a restaurant if the front foyer is dirty people are going to turn around you know people are going to uh, you know so we really cleaned up the place or hallways uh, use the word relentless before. If I saw graffiti, it, 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 I was I was wiping it off. But my my director of buildings and grounds was getting mad at me that I led the district in work orders because I wasn't tolerating, you know, that that lesser uh, thing. Um, and then really uh, caring, right? What is an organic way so the kids know that that we care? Experiencing the heartbreak of being passed up. And I was kind of, it was a trajectory. I was in a smaller, smallish district and I was assistant superintendent for five years. And it was like, I was next in line for that superintendent position. Mm -hmm. um, I had solid relationships, right? With staff, mm -hmm. community, um, with um, the board. And it was nothing short, but shocking. When I applied, I went for it. And, you know, it's a small community. Everybody knows everybody. There was a lot of embarrassment, you know, and just kind of humiliated. Mm -hmm. um, there was some political, um, of course, when decisions are made like this, right? right. Some political and, um, you know, backlash, community revolt. And I, at the time, thought to myself, okay, I have two choices here. Number one. I can stay and I can like be victim to a district that says we don't want you, but still stay. Right. Or I can pick myself off the ground because during those first few days, George, as I'm sure that you and I know certainly other leaders have experienced, you're in like this deep, dark place of my world's been turned upside down. And I don't even know really what my purpose is because I thought my purpose was being here. Right. And now that I'm being told it's not, I got to kind of redefine things in yep. my own mind. And so that's where I was like, okay, I, I did the grieving. I did the crying. I did the, you know, the behind the scenes, just outright pissed off piece. And then once I got to that point of, I can't stay, but I don't know where, Mm -hmm. It was like the opportunities just kept coming. Right. And I picked where I'm currently at, the charter schools, and it has been absolutely phenomenal. But I wouldn't have even had the opportunity to write, to speak, right. to do these other things if I would have been in that role of superintendent in that district. It just wouldn't have happened. It's amazing. You know, I have a very good friend. And if that friend is listening right now, text me that you're listening because that went through exactly the same thing that you're talking about. And they were by far the best person for the position. And it was like the politics and not focus on what is best for the school dis district, what's not best for the teachers, but you know, what makes the the board look really good or, you know, or, you know, there may be fear of some, you know, that happens and it's unfortunate. And I think that sometimes it's, it's a sign that you, it, it, Hey, it's time to go and serve another place. So like when, when educators say this to me, like, Oh, it's really hard to leave these kids, you know, like I've invested so much in them. I'm like, but there are other kids who need support as well. Right. 100%. Like it's not, it's, yeah. you're, and within a week, I promise you, you'll be like, wow, I can never leave these kids. Right. And that's how we feel because we there's an emotional connection to our communities and things like this. But I learned that I, I don't stay in places where 
you know, I think this is a really important aspect. I've been talking a lot about this over the last couple of years. Specifically, there is a difference between the idea of being valued and feeling valued. And if uh, leaders don't actually make that connection between the importance that people feel valued, mm-hmm. you can say all you want. Mm-hmm. But when you you develop them, and I, I can't remember the book, uh, but I read it, said you should never hire someone externally to a leadership position uh, unless they are 30% better. Now, how you measure that than anybody else, because there's all those things you have to teach them about the culture, about the community and things like that too, that if they're not like head and, you know, shoulders above, way better than anybody else, then, then it doesn't really make sense to do that. Yeah. So I really appreciate you sharing that story. And I know uh, specifically people that I've connected with that have felt passed over and not for the right reasons. The balance that I see sometimes, and I've shared this often, is that if you push people too hard, they actually will crumble. But if you if you show too much support without that push, people don't think it's actually what you're doing is that important. So you got to kind of find that balance that I've seen a lot of educators over the years leave teaching because they felt they weren't growing under their current leadership. And when we actually try to, and this is this is a problem that a lot of teachers talk about, and I think it's really powerful, is they feel so micromanaged. And I actually would say if I kind of fell in the balance is that I didn't maybe, um, I don't know if I'd say didn't support as much as I should have when I was a principal. I think part of it too is, you know, you always kind of look back on your career because I actually, I, I didn't want to micromanage my, my people and part of it was because I didn't want to be micromanaged as an educator, as a teacher. So I always wanted to think about what's the principle I wanted when I was a teacher and how am I being that person? But the weird thing is micromanaging takes a lot of time that if you're trying to control everything, you tend to not be able to do other things. You not really grow. And so kind of putting people in a position where they know they have autonomy, but you're also there to help them grow to become better. And that, that Lasorda quote, and I'll share it again. I believe that managing is like holding a dove in your hand. If you hold it too tightly, you kill it. But if you hold it too loosely, you lose it. I think that's a really powerful quote and just a great summary of leadership. And this beautifully lands in to the something professional part of this podcast. And I, I've kind of mentioned it uh, here and there, but really haven't made a, a formal announcement. But right now, uh, myself and Allison Apsey, and if you don't know Allison Apsey, I really think you should follow her. She's absolutely amazing, brilliant leader, brilliant educator, and an absolutely amazing writer. I've known her for years. Uh, her and I met at a Michigan Elementary School Principal Conference that I was so blessed to be able to uh, keynote several years ago. And her and I just had great conversations. We've stayed connected ever since. And she'll tell you that she started blogging after that conference, after seeing me. And so it's really, really cool because her and I are actually writing a book together. And I'll say, you know, I say that in quotations um, because there's more to just her and I writing this book. And it's simply called What Makes a Great Principle. And I think Alice and I, um, kind of when we decided to write this book, this has kind of been a couple of years in the making. And I, I really didn't, really didn't, have a vision of what this book could look like until I let it sit for a little while. And some of the advice I give to writers uh, as I work with them often is don't force a book, let it come to you, let it, let it happen. And basically I read her book called a, called leading the whole teacher. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I saw elements of what, what makes a great principal and what that could look like in how she wrote leading the whole teacher and so her and I are working on this and we have identified five domains of basically what great principles do. And we base this on, you know, um, research that we've done on this topic, obviously, but also looking at what organizations kind of um, have shared and, and kind of synthesizing those ideas. And I really wanted to write this book, not because I ever thought I was a great principal, but because I knew I had a really great principle. And if I didn't have that great principle, I wouldn't be talking to you today. I'd probably be in a different profession. And I really didn't know what a great principle was until I had one. And so we share about this, but here's what's really unique about the book. 
we do get insights from uh, either current or former principals talking about those domains and really what they learned um, uh, and, and, and how they actually shared it, how they implemented those ideas. But here's what's really unique about the book. Um, one of the questions I've been asking forever to teachers is, would you want to be a student in your own classroom? And the, the reality of this is, when you ask that question, you're really trying to understand who are the people you serve, what's their experience in the places that you actually create, and moving backward from there. And asking that question, I think, is a really important one. But the other question, I kind of mentioned it earlier, is would I want to be a staff member on a school that I was principal? Too often when I, when I talk to people that you know maybe are considering going into admin, becoming administrators, they'll say to me, I don't want to do those things that that my principal does. And I'm like, well, when you're the principal, you kind of do what you want. Um, you know, and I know that's, people feel that's not totally true. The reality of really great principals is that if you are good with communication, if you're good with your community, you have a lot of flexibility, right? If you're getting phone calls to the superintendent's office all the time, things totally change. But there's a lot of opportunity to create what you wanted as a teacher when you became a principal. And here's why this book is going to be unique. We actually have uh, teachers or former teachers, even uh, a student or two, who are writing stories about great principals they've had and how they actually um, showed those domains that Allison and I have focused on and really um, what some of the strategies that their principals use that brought out the best in them. And I think that's what's unique. A lot of times when, when you read a book, it's coming from, uh, from like a top-down perspective. People that, you know, were superintendents telling principals how they should be because they've worked with so many principals. But teacher, there's more teachers have worked with principals than anybody. And the reality of this is um, we wanted to get their perspective and hear their stories and share that. And so a lot of times I hear principals saying, you know, it's really important that we consider the people that we're serving. And so that's why we we're actually having this book as a collaboration between myself, Allison, and some really great principals, but most importantly, from the teachers and the students they've served. And so hearing their perspective. And so if you are either a principal, an aspiring administrator, or you work with principals, I think it's going to really be a great book. And Allison is just an amazing writer. I feel so blessed to be working with her on this. And the contributors we have, and we'll be announcing that pretty soon, are incredible. And so that's the something professional part of this um, podcast.